Well, you can take your seat belts off. We're going to calm down now a little bit. <laughs> Isn't he something? Yeah. And I need the toy. Here we are. Well, what I'd like to do is to start where Bruce left off. Oh, by the way, just uh, it occurred to me when uh, I was being introduced about the 14 years in, in the business world, and, and Doug said, well, something made him transition. I can tell you it was living in fear for 14 years. <laughs> it was living in protection. I don't know if you spend any time in the corporate world, but there's a tendency to uh, circle the wagons and, uh, and hope it's, uh, you're going to be safe. So I had done my time there. I saw a lot of pain. I saw a lot of opportunity, but in the position I was in, I couldn't do much with it. And so I really felt in the midst of really having everything that uh, you're supposed to want. Uh, good job, uh, big bucks, uh, all the creature comforts you could ask for, but what I noticed was my soul was hurting. I wasn't okay there. I wasn't okay just getting paid to do something I really didn't want to do and to sell something I didn't care about. So that was a crisis in a sense for me, but it was a real uh, spiritual emergence as well. It was a coming out. It was a uh, a time to choose. Did I want to do my heart's desire or did I just want to fold into the, uh, the norm and do what, what I was expected to do? And I made the change. And 14 years later, I can highly recommend doing it. It's, uh, it's challenging at the time, especially uh, when I did it and the way I did it, because I walked away from a very high paying job and it was a very good job by all people's standards, but it, uh, it wasn't feeding the right part of me. So I'm here tonight and I'm really grateful to Doug and to Bruce for the opportunity to share with you some of the things I've discovered over the last 14 years uh, about the nature of change and about the nature of beliefs and their effect on our lives. So let's get going. I want to start with Bruce's conclusions plus one that I added to the list. Do you remember his slide that said perception controls behavior? Very powerful words coming especially from a biologist. Perception controls the genes, perception rewrites genes, and where I'm going with this is perception also rewrites behavior. I expect there's just uh, two or three of you in the room maybe that might have a few behaviors you'd like to rewrite. Uh, I certainly did, especially 14 years ago, and so my search was to find the easiest, uh, sanest, most effective, and quite frankly, the, the most painless way to do it. Uh, graduate school didn't teach me about the painless part. In fact, it was all about go back, find the pain, work through the pain, and that's the only way to change your beliefs. Uh, I do have a different story to tell you at this point, uh, quite, a, quite a lot different than that schooling. The thing about perception, because Bruce used the word a lot and then he squeezed it together with the word uh, belief, I'd like to make a little bit of a distinction there for us uh, this evening. Perception, in my opinion, is awareness. The dictionary calls it awareness, but it's shaped by belief. Belief actually precedes perception. And I'm going to be talking about how that happens, but the important fact about it is that beliefs control your perceptions. If you rewrite the beliefs, you can rewrite perception. And if you rewrite the perception, you can rewrite the genes and the behavior. So there really is no distinction, if you're in the healing arts, especially the complementary ones, between mind and body. It's just a dif different expression of us, who we are. I want to define beliefs as a working definition anyway in the following way. Beliefs are conclusions derived from experience, and, uh, information and or experience. They can be either conscious or subconscious. And what I mean by this, let me give you an example. Beliefs uh, derived by conclusions from information would be the kind of thing that would happen if you got jury duty and you weren't at the event that's being tried, let's say it's a criminal case, you weren't there present when the so-called crime was committed, but you're sitting in a jury situation. You're now required to listen to information from two attorneys telling you their story, getting you ultimately to come to some truth, some level of belief about what happened in that event you couldn't attend. So you're creating a belief through information alone. The second version of that is experience. Uh, typical experiences say you're two years old, imagine, and you've never experienced uh, fire before. So you're crawling around and there's a candle left on and you're getting curious because you haven't had an experience with a candle or fire yet. So as uh, most kids that are two years old, they'll move towards anything they don't understand to discover what it is. 
So you move closer and closer to that candle, and isn't it interesting? So you stick your little hand out, like you do with everything else, to touch it and grab it and see what it is like, and sure enough, you get burned. Well, as soon as you get burned, you've had an experience. Now it's not just curiosity that's associated with that candle. There's an experience and a conclusion that is drawn from touching that fire, which turns into a belief, which ultimately, as I'll, as I'll show you, affects your future perception of candle. In the beginning, there's not much... Uh, uh, of a uh, differentiated perception, but in, after an experience like that, there certainly is. And then the, uh, I'm going to talk a lot more about the conscious and subconscious mind, because this is where, in my opinion, the greatest amount of ignorance exists in mainstream psychotherapy, is that we've been trying to work, uh, trying to change subconscious beliefs uh, with lots of conscious means. And it turns out the two minds are so different that it's no wonder it doesn't work very well. Your beliefs actually determine your biological and behavioral reality. If I had to, to just describe Bruce's presentation in total in one statement, this would be it. Virtually every part of our lives is governed by our belief systems. And we'll talk about that a little more too. Do you remember this slide? Here's the filter representing our belief systems. And if you look at it from this point of view, it's really a powerful thing to witness. Beliefs are really the filters of reality. You don't see the world as it is. You see the world as you are. In fact, you can't not do that. It's the most interesting thing is that each of you sitting out there looking at this presentation are actually having a very different experience of it. You all have the illusion it's the same experience. You'll talk about having been here, but it's not the same experience for you at all. Your set of filters about who I am, what I'm saying, where this place is, how you're feeling right now, that all profoundly affects your experience of this evening. So you think, well, it was a fact, here's what happened, but then you start talking to your friend that you came with or someone else that attended this particular uh, event, they had a very different experience. So it's always that way. And if you can remember that, as soon as you're thinking, well, I've got the facts straight about something, remember, the facts are your subjective opinion, your filters of reality. And that's what, that's what perceptions are all about. That's what really matters here. Beliefs create perceptions, and they affect virtually every area of your life, as I mentioned. Self-esteem, for instance. I mean, your perceptions either define you as worthy or worthless in relationships, either loved or or unloved. Uh, with respect to prosperity, that's a pretty popular one. You either can attract money easily in, in your life or your perception is it's hard to get and hard to keep and you'd mismanage it anyway. Uh, you look at your job performance, if your perception of yourself is, as a competent person or an incompetent person, it's going to make a heck of a lot of difference in terms of how you perform your job and also the perception of others, of course. Mental health, you can see yourself as generally a happy person or a depressed one. Physical health, I mean, Bruce's presentation makes that pretty clear. The psychology profoundly impacts the biology of the body. Spiritual outlook, we have so many different spiritual systems and ways of looking at the hologram of God, so to speak, and all of the facets of it that uh, it is about perception when we're looking that causes us to, uh, to believe and act in the way we do. And, of course, the list goes on and on. You remember this slide? This is our friend Ecstasy. She represents joy. She represents growth in Bruce's model, moving towards something that's pleasurable. Do you remember this one? The scream, it's called. So this one, of course, represents protection and fear. So my question to you is, if you had a choice, if you could choose between living like this, having your life and the undertone of your life being this feeling that you get when you look at this, or this, which would you choose? Oh no, let's review again. <laughs> it's a tough choice. Would it be her? Or would it be him? All right, if you're having any trouble uh, uh, deciding here, or if you've decided you'd prefer this one, I only have one recommendation. See your doctor immediately and get your medication adjusted. <laughs> because under normal conditions, people are going to pick her. We want uh, consciously to have our lives work. We want the life, our lives to be filled with joy and pleasure and to look forward to each day. What prevents us from doing that? What is really the bottom line cause? How, do we, how, it is, how is it that your life maybe doesn't represent as much of this ecstasy as you'd like to it? 
have it represent right now. And I'll propose to you that what Bruce was telling you was absolute truth, and I'm just going to add a little bit to it. Whether you're living in growth and protection makes all the difference in the world. What determines that? Well, I can messages as a child versus I can't messages are one of the big ways that that determination happens. If you receive more positive input from your environment, generally your parents, for instance, and you were told that you were lovable, you were told that you could accomplish anything, you were told you were good enough, you were told that you were wonderful, then you're probably having a life that reflects that more now than anybody could imagine versus if you were told more I can't messages. You're not good enough, you'll never amount to anything, you're not smart enough, all those things that's, that many of us heard. Those go in just like experiences. Those are experiences. They're just information driven. They're parentally induced usually, reinforced by society. And so we end up with a series of experiences that either put us primarily in growth or protection from our perception of life. Turns out our childhood programming becomes our habits of perception and behavior. You get your programs early on. By about five years old, the psychologist will tell you, your personality is pretty well set. What they mean by that is, you've had enough experiences to draw conclusions about yourself, and now you're either lo looking at yourself through the growth or protection filters. The good news is, even if you have produced these filters and you have habits that are supporting the perceptions and the behaviors that you don't want, they are changeable. They are changeable. Habits are usually the things that bug us the most because, most because they are... They are what they are. Habits are things that happen out of your conscious awareness. It doesn't seem like you have any control over them. You consciously try to control the habit. You say you're not going to do something, but you do it anyway. So I want to explain to you how the cycle of habituation occurs, why it occurs, and then ultimately how you can break that cycle. These cycles are really self-reinforcing, and let me see if I can explain this to you. I'm going to use the candle as a model because we talked about that earlier. If you're two years old and you're having your first encounter with fire and it happens to be connected to a candle and you crawl over to this fire and it's a very interesting thing. You've not formed any opinions about candles or fire yet because you've never touched anything that was hot and now you do for the first time. All of a sudden you've got an experience. The experience is hurt. Ouch. That shapes the perception. The candle's no longer a general thing. Now it's a thing that could create pain. You have a perception of the candle. The perception creates a belief that candles are dangerous, or at least fire is dangerous. You've got it connected to the candle, but the main thing is the fire. That perception then shapes your experience of this candle. The experience reinforces the beliefs. What happens is, the next time you see a candle, instead of crawling over to it and sticking your hand in the candle, your perception of the candle as a possible source of pain keeps you from doing that. The fact that you're not going to go over there and stick your hand in that in that candle again, it, you'll never again have the same nebulous sort of perception. You're going to have a very specific perception of candles and you're going to watch out for it. Now whether as a child you learned about hot from sticking your hand in the fire and you got burned that way, or as you get older you have more complex experiences, you get burned in other ways. You get burned in relationships as they say. That's a very complex form of burn, but it's a burn nevertheless. And it usually leaves a mark so that when you, next time when you look at that situation, whether it's a relationship or whatever it was where you got hurt, you're going to move away from that. You're going to move into protection. And it's a self-reinforcing cycle. So some of the good cycles, like learning that fire is hot and to keep your hand out of it, is wonderful. You don't want to interrupt those cycles. But what about the cycles of self-deprecation? What about the cycles that say you're not good enough? What about the cycles that aren't very generative, that you'd like to get rid of? Then it would be important to be able to break the cycles. Basically, breaking the cycle amounts to rewriting the software of your mind, because then you can change the printout of your experience. As Bruce said so eloquently, it's about your perception. If you can change how you perceive the environment, essentially how you can perceive yourself in the environment, you can change the environment. You'll be treated differently the second you treat yourself differently. We're told that, you know, day in and day out by all the positive thinkers, but they stop at that part. And then what do you do? Well, there is a something you can do, but how do you do it? It requires two things, really, information and tools. I'm going to give you a little bit more information, and then we'll get to the tool part. And please understand that with respect to the tools and the confines of my situation tonight, which is one hour, not two days in a workshop, I'll be able to hopefully demonstrate at least one of the Psyche 
change processes that I've developed over the years uh, so that you can get an idea of how quickly uh, a belief you may have had all of your life actually can change and how you can verify that it's different uh, as, as soon as it changes. So we'll be doing both things. Now one of the key pieces of information you need to be aware of that makes all the difference in the world is that you don't have one mind, you have two. I mean, haven't you ever tried to change your mind only to find out your mind is a mind of its own? <laughs> bet you have. And I'll bet you, you relate to some of these things down here, the ways in which people try to do that. If you've ever promised yourself you'd get in shape, but then you didn't. Ever made a New Year's resolution you didn't keep? Ever tried to quit smoking? Try to stop procrastinating. That's a favorite one. You swore you'd never get involved with another relationship, but you do. And the list goes on, and you can fill in your favorite personal one down there about what you've tried to change, and you said you wanted to change it, so there's a conscious intention, a commitment. You're a bright, energetic, committed person, but somehow it just doesn't come off. It doesn't happen, even with your intention focused in that direction. Let me give you a little rundown on how different those two minds are, because this is very important in understanding the nature of how change can take place very quickly and why it's been so difficult with the tools we've been given for the past 35 years, which are mostly positive thinking, affirmations, willpower, that sort of thing. I don't know about you, I tried them all. You know, they worked maybe 20% of the time, very frustrating, but it was best we had at the time, so people kept doing it. Just say your affirmations, just do that meditation, just do it over and over and over again. The problem was, it's, it turns out, we were mostly talking to the wrong part of the mind that's in charge of habits, in charge of the change. Look, conscious mind, it's volitional. It sets goals, judges results, and it likes to try new things. That's the one that says, hey, there's something good happening, let's go out and do it. Let's go into an environment we've never been in. Let's ride the killer roller coaster. <laughs> let's do a bungee jump, you know? It's the one that would say, hey, that's a great idea. But your subconscious mind didn't like that at all. Subconscious mind says, it's busy monitoring the operations of your body, basic things like motor functions, heart rate, digestion, and it prefers the familiar. It's the part of you that likes to play it safe. It wants to know what's going to happen in the next moment. It doesn't want something new to contend with. Its basic job is to keep you alive and safe. So why would it want to bungee jump or get on a roller coaster? It's not interested in that. So remember, volitional and habitual. Two different components of you completely. The conscious mind thinks abstractly. It's conceptually based. The subconscious mind thinks literally. It sees the world through your five senses. Bruce mentioned the five senses. You're going to see, hear, feel, taste, and smell. That's the only way the subconscious mind can know reality. The conscious mind is the one that reads all those self-help books. It's the one that says, yeah, aren't we inspired? Let's go for it. It's got all of that energy about uh, what you're going to do. It thinks up all those really great ideas. But without communicating the ideas to the subconscious mind uh, adequately, you usually don't go anywhere. You get very excited. You ever been to motivational speeches? I mean, just plain, flat motivational speeches. I mean, when I was in the corporate world, boy, we just did a lot of those. And I'd go into those things, and they'd just whip you into a frenzy. I was clapping and stomping and yelling and screaming, and I was so happy. And then as soon as that motivational speaker left, so did the motivation. If you didn't get him or her to come back, which is the point of it, of course, <laughs> if you come back and get that fixed, you get cranked up again. But there's a better way to do that. There's a better way to get to that place and to stay there, and it has nothing to do with motivation, actually. The conscious mind is responsible for short-term memory, the subconscious mind for long-term memory. Now, short-term memory has a little trick to it. I don't know if you know this, but it's an interesting fact. The average length of short-term memory in human beings is about 20 seconds long, short-term memory. Now, I thought that was really interesting because do you know how long it takes to look a phone number up in a phone book, take the coins out of your purse or pocket, and get them into a machine and dial that? 25 seconds. God's little trick. Yeah. So you can't quite pull that off in short-term memory. The subconscious mind is a very important uh, aspect of this change process that I'm going to be sharing with you because it is responsible for long-term memory, a critical element. If you get up in the morning and you've forgotten basic things that you learned when you were a child, oh, like, say, walking, you know, things like that, uh, driving as an adult, you have to relearn everything every morning when you got up. So you don't have to do that, and you can thank your subconscious mind because it remembers all of those things. It's taken all of that conscious learning and turned it into habitual understanding. Think about driving for a minute. You know, when you first learned how to drive a car, 
How many learned on a stick shift? I'm just curious. Are you old enough to have? Okay. Yeah, well, me too. And it was a nightmare. I don't know about you, but I'm sitting in, the, in this little car, and I've got a, a gear shift over here. It was on the column. That's how old I am. It was on a column shift, and I got two feet, but there are three pedals. I'm thinking bad engineering right away. You know, it's a problem. What am I going to do with those? Then you've got mirrors. You've got people coming this way, people behind you. You've got to steer the darn thing. You've got a clutch, accelerator, brake. I mean, it was completely overwhelming, not counting my father, who was sitting next to me, yelling at me the whole time because he wanted to save his transmission in that car. And I'm popping the clutch, and it was an awful experience. But eventually, having survived it, I was able to move into an automatic version of driving, and now I don't think about it at all. In fact, most people don't think about driving at all. I noticed since I got here, anyway. <laughs> this is a very interesting place. <laughs> But you know, the beauty of it is you can have a conversation on the way from point A to point B. You don't remember driving at all. You had a great conversation, but somehow you get there. What's that about? I mean, who's paying attention? Fortunately, you have a very powerful part of you that is paying attention. That's your subconscious mind. That gets you around when you're doing the things that are really fun, and it takes care of most of these baseline things that uh, would uh, consume all our time if we had to do them consciously. All right, the conscious mind is time-bound which means it's past and future based. And for most conscious minds, if you're living with the scream uh, mentality, you spend most of your time regretting your past and agonizing over the future. So that's not very much fun. Your subconscious mind is timeless, however. It thinks in the proverbial present moment only. So when you're talking to the subconscious mind, this fact is very important. It doesn't understand future tense requests. If you put your request, uh, what you want, in a future tense for the subconscious, it mostly yawns and goes back to digesting your dinner because it doesn't get it. So you have to talk present tense. Now that seems a little crazy from your conscious mind's point of view because it's thinking, well, that hadn't happened yet. If I'm making up this statement that I want to be true, shouldn't I say I want it to be true? Only if you're trying to convince your conscious mind. So there's some rules about how you address and communicate with the subconscious that are very important to making it all work. Another difference, very important one, the conscious mind is, has limited processing capacity, maybe one to three events it can handle at a time. If you're uh, at home and the phone rings and you're watching a TV program and somebody walks in uh, from the, the, the kitchen and they want to talk to you, uh, about that time when those three things are going on, you're saying, wait a minute, one thing at a time, well, you know, I've got to stop now. Because you really can't process. It only is processing at about a rate of 2,000 bits of information per second, which sounds wonderful and, and, and kind of awesome in its own way, unless you compare it to the subconscious mind, who has expanded processing capacity, can process thousands of events at a time, and averages 4 billion bits of processing capacity in a, in a given second. That's, that's an incredible difference. But if you think about it, this part of your mind would have to do that. Remember, it's in charge of motor functions. You can't walk, talk, digest your food, do respiration, digestion, or any of that without a huge amount of processing capacity. You couldn't sit up in your chairs. Because what you take for granted, you just say, well, I'm going to do that. You turn on your volition part, which is your conscious mind, and say, let's walk from here to there. But you know, you can't walk from here to there consciously. If your subconscious mind doesn't agree, you aren't going anywhere. And that's true of your beliefs changing, too. And we're getting to that. All right. It's easy to change habits of thought and behavior if you access the subconscious mind because it's the storehouse for attitudes, values, and beliefs. This is where doing your basic affirmations every day, which are generally so abstract that the subconscious mind can't understand it. It really doesn't care what you're trying to do because you haven't engaged it in any way, shape, or form. And you're talking to the wrong part of the mind in the first place. The subconscious mind is where all these attitudes, values, and beliefs are stored. So if you don't learn how to communicate with it properly, you aren't going to get very far. You're going to be very frustrated. And that's exactly what I was. <laughs> that's why I'm sharing with you these, uh, a, a whole different approach. All right, so as um, the, the, the easiest and most effective way to communicate with the subconscious is, is through a process called muscle testing. And I'll bet you a bunch of you in this room have had some experience with muscle testing. Is that true? Can I see a show of hands? All right. So I'm going to ask you temporarily during this, this uh, discussion and also an experience that I'd like you to have to forget everything you know about it right now. Pretend you don't have any preconceived notions about it. Humor me. There's some things that are very important about using muscle testing in a psychological way that are very different 
from using it in almost every other way. Vitamin mineral supplements, it's very popular in applied kinesiology, clinical kinesiology, looking for organ distress, meridian dysfunctions, and so on. I'm not going to be talking about any of that, but I'm going to be talking about some key elements to using it as an accurate measure of what's going on in your subconscious mind, what those beliefs are and what they're not. Okay, we're going to have a little experience and I'm going to ask uh, someone to help me up here to demonstrate uh, muscle testing a la Psyche. Psyche is the name, of the, uh, the name I give the work that I do. And I want to show you when I'm using it as a psychological tool to access the subconscious and check for beliefs, uh, how to set up an appropriate communication system. And the key here is, is, is appropriate. You want to get a true false uh, message system going, in other words, a conflict detector, the truth. You're measuring the truth between what, you, what your conscious mind says or is affirming and what your subconscious mind believes. Very important to be able to do that credibly. Like dislike is essentially equivalent to a stress detector. Uh, I learned this one uh, to use uh, muscle testing in this way. Uh, when I got out of graduate school, I was doing sort of mainstream counseling. That's the insight-based talk therapy version where you come in and we sit down together and you tell me all your woes and I nod and say, yeah, that's interesting, tell me more about that. And you do. And then you come back next week and you tell me more about that. And come back next week and you tell me more about that. Well, I got tired of hearing it, they got tired of talking about it, so I figured something's got to change here. And a part of me, which was really the business part, uh, just said, wait a minute, there's got to be some kind of outcome here. I mean, business is all about outcomes, all about bottom line. Turns out therapy, as I was taught in graduate, graduate school, is all about process. You just stay in the process. It's good for you. Oh, where's the part where you get out and get a life? I mean, you know, <laughs> when does it end? Well, apparently it wasn't supposed to end. I never got that. So I thought, well, that's not right. So we're going to do something about that. So in the like-dislike thing, what, what I found was interesting was I'd get people coming in. They'd fill out this intake form. And uh, I'd always ask, have you, have you had any other kind of counseling? And they're, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're putting it down there, 15 years of psychotherapy and all that. <laughs> that's no joke. And they would say, I'd say, okay. So, uh, and they're writing down what their primary uh, presenting problem is, what, what they're trying to deal with. And they just write down stuff about, I said, what, what about your childhood? Tell me about your relationship between your mother and a father, you know. So, so I remember this one client wrote down, yeah, well, I've dealt with my mother, you know, she was very abusive uh, psychologically and physically, and, uh, but, you know, I've dealt with that and I'm over it. And I said, oh, that's good. So uh, we, we got to the muscle testing part and I just had her, had her stick her arm out and I was going to do a little muscle test, a stress, stress detector uh, style. And I said, think about your mother. So she did. <laughs> and guess what happened? She just crashed and burned. I mean, she was, she was a mess. The muscle response was very clear that just thinking about her mother still stressed her. All of those years of psychotherapy, all of those years of putting together reasons why I've now forgiven my mother, never got to the subconscious mind, which controls the motor functions, which controls the autonomic nervous system, which controls your biology, and ultimately your health. You know, Bruce mentioned, do you remember about the biology and the effect on our immune systems? There are a whole set of beliefs that are immune-enhancing beliefs and a whole set of beliefs that are immune-suppressing beliefs. And if you look at the personality profiles of people who get various diseases, it becomes very interesting in a hurry. There's a whole field called psychoneuroimmunology, about 35 years of study in this country anyway, showing that people, for instance, cancer patients, one of the key um, qualities and attributes, uh, personality characteristics of cancer patients is long-repressed anger and hatred. They're really angry at somebody else, but if you hold that anger inside you, guess where it gets directed? It's your immune system. So the question is, how do you let go of stuff like that? We're going to be getting to that. So third down here is setting up a yes or no communication system because in this work that I do, it's essential that you can communicate with the subconscious in a way to ask it questions and let it determine even what process is going to be used within this model of psyche that I use. There are a variety of belief change processes just as there would be if I was a carpenter and I had my little bag of tools. I'd have a pair of pliers and a screwdriver and a hammer at the very least. Because otherwise, if you just handed a hammer and you say, go build that house, well, you better find a lot of nails because that's all you're going to be able to deal with. So you need some way to communicate a yes or no, um, get yes or no communication from the subconscious. The, the last little note here, and I'll, I'll demonstrate this in just a second with someone, is where you position your eyes when you're muscle testing for psychological responses matters, as it turns out. Uh, and I'll show you. I'll demonstrate that for you. Uh, I learned this through, uh, actually, this little piece of it, through studying NLP years ago. They had made a big deal out of where your eyes are focused in terms of how you're processing 
uh, in your brain. And what I found out when I first uh, was introduced to muscle testing as a means of communication was that sometimes it seemed to answer correctly and sometimes the answers were really bogus and I couldn't figure out what the heck was going on. And I finally pieced the mystery together and I figured out, wait a minute, sometimes people are saying things, they're having no emotional response to at all. Your arm doesn't operate automatically. It doesn't go strong or weak for no particular reason. If you're not having a response to it internally, then the electrical signal sent from your brain to the muscle has no effect. So I want to show you how that works. And then I'd like you to just have an experience of this, because when I do a demonstration up here, I want you to be wired into what's actually going on and not just watching me do something up here that you're not familiar with. So I would like to invite someone who would uh, like to um, help me demonstrate this muscle testing process to come up. OK, would you mind? That's great. And you might want to come over here. And you are? Juliana. Juliana. Juliana, if you'll come over here, uh, which arm would you like to use for muscle testing? Are you most comfortable with this uh, one? Arm. OK. So let's see if we can get you in some light and me in some light. This is good. OK. Uh, I'm going to demonstrate all three of these things, and then I'm going to have you do just one for the sake of time and for your experience. But what I'm doing is I'm standing in, next to Juliana's arm. Rather than in front of her like this, uh, I want her to be able to have uh, clear vision over here and me out of her line of fire. Uh, so we're not exchanging too much information in our bio fields right now. <laughs> so Juliana, what I'd like you to do is the following. I'm going to be pressing down on your arm gently. I've got my hand here on your wrist rather than on your hand, and my other hand gently on your shoulder. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to be pressing down. I want you to resist that pressure, okay? okay? But with your eyes, I'd like you to actually put your nose out here in this direction, and your, not your head, but just your eyes focused towards the floor. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm sorry, you can turn your nose over here. You're doing great. And just put your eyes towards the floor and hold them right there. I'm going to press down. Let's just do this together. And I'll tell you before I press, because I'm going to say the words, be strong, OK? OK. Here we go. Be strong. Good. Now, I'm just calibrating to find out what that's like. Am I pressing OK? It's not too hard. It's not OK. Let's try out some stuff and see what happens. So we're going to go with the first uh, uh, communication link up here. I'm going to have you say something that we know is true about you. And I'm going to ask you to do this one. This is the one that you will do as a, uh, an experiment. So I want you to use your name, because it's something your subconscious probably agrees with, unless you're going by an alias. So I want you to look down. And out loud, Juliana, I'd like you to say, my name is Juliana. My name is Juliana. And be strong as I press. Good for you. So let's have you lie now. This is a really important thing. In fact, I'll set this up. If you get away with this and you can keep your muscles strong, everybody out here will give you 20 bucks. Okay. okay. Hey, pretty good, huh? I just spent your money. I hope you're okay. You're rooting for me now, aren't you? Okay. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to, again, with your face out here but your eyes towards the floor. Mm -hmm. I want, let's make you um, somebody else completely, like some guy named Bill. We'll make you male. Your name is Bill. So I want you to say out loud like you really mean it. Okay. My name is Bill. All right. My name is Bill. Be strong, Bill. <laughs> and see what happens. I'm pressing gently, but her arm is actually moving down rather than locking in place. I know all of you can't see that exactly, but trust me on this. It, can you feel the difference? Yes. Yeah, it's dramatic to her and to me, and I'm pressing very lightly. It's not about pressing harder. It's about when she says something that isn't true, roughly, you can rest your arm, roughly what's happening is the equivalent to what happens in a polygraph machine. The brain is actually changing frequencies. The signal is changing. It's going into conflict because there's no file in there, either the gender file, which says she's a female and she's affirming she's male, and the name file crashes because her name isn't Bill, it's Juliana. So two things are going on that create conflict at the brainwave level. The signal, electrical signal from the brain to the muscle is what causes the muscle to go weak. It's not that her muscle mass changes or that I have to press any harder. It's simply a restricted signal because of the confusion, the conflict in the brain. That electrical signal is diminished. The muscle response is much, much weaker. So if you can detect this difference, you can set up this binary code. It's a natural biofeedback mechanism built into every one of us. So if you use it properly, it's very, very wonderful to find out what's going on at levels of your consciousness that you can't find out consciously about. So let's do the next one. Let's uh, do an experiment with like, dislike. So what I'd like you to do is this. I'd simply like you, again, with your face out here, your eyes focused towards the floor, think of something you like, a circumstance, a situation you really like to be in, and get the feeling of being in it, and then let me know when you're there. I would like to be in it? You would like, yeah. Feeling a situation you'd like to be in. Okay. It can be something you've already done, but you can think about it and go, yeah, I like that. Okay. You got it? Mm -hmm. It'd be real strong. <clears throat> She's really strong to that. She likes that a lot. So we won't have you talk about that, OK? <laughs> OK. I want you to switch gears. I want you to think of something that you don't like, equally powerful, but the opposite of that pleasant feeling. And take your time and let me know when you've gotten into that feeling, something you don't like. 
Oh, you can think of a food or a person or... Okay, okay. Oh, that helped. What, <laughs> oh, what, was that the person one she was? <laughs> okay. Take your time. You have to get into the experience of it. Okay. You let me know when you're feeling the feeling of it. Got it? And be strong. Sure enough. Can you feel that? It's real dramatic over here. So she's going very weak to that feeling. I don't have to know what it is, but I can tell it stresses her. It's real easy. We're using this as a stress detector. And the final one is to set up a yes or no communication system. This can be done very simply. All I want you to do in your mind silently is just repeat the word yes over and over and over in your head. So just listen to it silently. Mm -hmm. And be strong as I press. Good. Repeat the word no. Hear that over and over. Okay. And be real strong. Feel the difference? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you see a little bit of her movement? Because she's moving and that arm is dropping real easily and I'm pressing very gently. This isn't a wrestling match. I mean, some muscle testers just want to yank on your arm and they got all kinds of agendas and stuff. It isn't about that. It's just pressing hard enough on the arm to detect whether the muscle locks in place or unlocks. Because as long as you're getting strong and weak responses and your intention is clear about what you're testing, you have a really powerful internal communication system going on here. So let me propose the following. Given our seating arrangement, I want to suggest this. Instead of standing like I'm standing with Juliana this way, I want you to, in a minute, you'll be standing up where, you're, where you are, pick a partner that you're close to, and, and actually stand facing me and have your arm come out towards the back of the chair in front of you. Stand to the side like this. That way we don't hurt anybody because <laughs> your arm's coming out this way, not to your side. There's not much room to the side. You're going to have your partner do the following thing. I just want you to use the truth detector for right now just to have this experience. The way this happens is this. You're going to take your hand, put it gently on top of the wrist, not on the hand that bends here, but on the bone up here. Your other hand, just rest it gently on the, on the shoulder of your partner. They are to be looking, their face is straight, but their eyes are looking down. If your eyes are looking down, you will be emotionally connected to the statement you're making. If your eyes move around, this may not work for you, so this is very important. Head straight, chin parallel to the ground, eyes focused down, and then have your partner say, my name is, and use your real name. So one more time, Juliana. My name is Juliana. And be strong. And I want you to say be strong just before you press, okay, to warn the partners. Because if you just jerk like that or you start pressing when they're not ready, you can't tell when the muscle's strong or weak. So let's switch gears. We'll make you somebody else again. This time you can be some guy named Jim. Imagine you're Jim. Say, my name is Jim. My name is Jim. Be strong, Jim. You feel a difference. Yeah, it's really dramatic and you just press gently. I want you to have this experience because after a little while I'm going to use this muscle testing connection to demonstrate one of the belief change processes. So take about... It won't be more than two to five minutes at the most. I'll yell at you after a while, but I'd like you to have the experience both ways of doing muscle testing this way and just see, what, see how it turns out. Thank you very much, Thanks. Juliana. Go ahead. Going okay? Yeah. I went over a little bit, but not too much. Five or ten minutes. It's okay. Anybody else looking for a partner? Remember to focus your eyes down. Look down at the carpet. Okay, and when you've finished, have a seat. When you've finished the experience, have a seat, and I'll know you're getting ready. All right. Let's bring it back. All right, how was that? Is it okay? Work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. There's a question. I'm sorry, I can't hear the question. Uh huh. And, and you wonder why, yes. Okay, 
a couple things can be going on. One is eye position. Your head has to be up, not cocked down, looking straight. That's why your chin has to be parallel to the ground and your eyes are focused down during the testing. If that's happening, then you will be more associated, more emotionally engaged in what's happening when you're talking. When you say something is true, there'll be a stronger sense of reaction in your physical body and that's what causes the muscle testing to work. It isn't a mystical experience, it's a biological, neurological experience. It's really a very cheap biofeedback machine that you carry around connected to you your physical body. So used properly, uh, it, it will work fine. The other possibilities, and I, I don't have time to discuss them right now in terms of the anomalies, sometimes people will test weak to everything. There's a specific reason for that, and it turns out that's an easy correction. Sometimes they'll test strong to everything, no matter where their eyes are looking. And if you're strong to everything, that's another condition in the body that's happening at the time, and there's a corrective procedure for that. But even here, you know, I bet you there 90 plus percent of you had the experience as you normally would, and a small percentage may need some kind of tweaking, in other words, to make it work really well. If you've never experienced muscle testing before, uh, sometimes it can just be plain surprising. You know, it worked. What's that about? Because consciously you walk around thinking you're in control of your body and your behaviors and your responses and all of that, and the fact is mostly you're not. Mostly you have your subconscious mind running the program, both, both behaviorally and biologically, and you're just not used to accessing it and experiencing it consciously. So muscle testing is a simple way to do that. So, on we go. Not only do you have two minds, you have two hemispheres of the brain. And this is one of the key pieces also associated with the change process. Uh, and I'm going to give you just a quick course, uh, Hemispheres 101 here, so we can move along. Most of you are familiar with the basic concept of uh, brain dominance theory. You have a left brain and a right brain, a left hemisphere and right hemisphere. The left side of your brain is really the primary center for logic, linear thinking. Uh, it's the primary speech center, so uh, that's where your words come from. It tends to be uh, analytical. It breaks things down into parts rather than putting them together. And it just loves the order and control of things. That's the part of you that thinks it's really good to get to work on time and to get your jobs done on time and can balance your checkbook and all those things that are a function of you know, ordinary life. So it's a good thing we have that hemisphere. But it's not the hemisphere where you have much fun, I notice. So you want to, you want to take into consideration the right brain, the right hemisphere. It's where your emotions are, it's where uh, pictures are made in your head instead of uh, words. It tends to synthesize rather than analyze, so it puts things together uh, rather than breaks them apart. And it tends to be the one that enjoys that feeling of being spontaneous and free. So when the weather's great and you could go do something really fun, that's the part that argues let's go, and the other side says no, we've got to get our work done first. So uh, sometimes they compete, in fact, almost always, uh, for your attention and control of your system, by the way. The arrows down at the bottom uh, represent this, this crossover relationship uh, between the, the hemispheres of the brain and the side of the body that, uh, that they control. For instance, the left hemisphere of the brain controls motor functions on the right side of the body and vice versa. The right hemisphere controls them on the left. Now, there's a, a word down at the bottom, or two words down at the bottom, corpus callosum, is a bundle of nerve fibers. They're like Think of them as fiber optic links, millions of them, part of a, a very sophisticated commissure system that uh, is a communication pathway between the left and the right hemisphere. On a good day, uh, when both hemispheres are talking to each other, uh, you're getting a lot of crosstalk going, that communication system is wide open. So you're, it's really a bridge between the hemispheres. And when things aren't going so well or you get stressed, as Bruce was talking about, the fight or flight response, what typically happens here is that that commissure system, that uh, corpus callosum, uh, shuts down like it becomes a, a barricade rather than a bridge to crosstalk. And so you will go into a favored hemisphere uh, to deal with a given situation. It's not that people are all left brain or right brain. The research uh, was very clear about that, but the pop culture didn't, didn't get that part. It's much easier to write about, oh, what are you, left brain or right brain? Well, guess what? You've got two hemispheres and you're both. The issue is in a given situation, if you learn to over-identify with the qualities and attributes of one hemisphere versus the other, you will do that habitually until that's changed. The ideal circumstance, obviously, is to have both hemispheres working all the time, to be in a state I call the whole brain state, because then you have all the qualities and attributes available to deal with almost any situation. You don't automatically go into protection in a situation unless it's warranted, and then you can go there, because sometimes fight or flight's a good thing. You know, you, you got to get out of there, get the blood out of the viscera, get it to the limbs, and get out of dodge. So 
it's, it's all right to have that happen, but you want to be able to control it. You want to be able to perceive your reality through both hemispheres at the same time. And this little tidbit will come up in a little while, so I just wanted you to have a, a working um, reminder about it. The other thing is, the mind is not the brain. It's a very important concept. Bruce alludes to it all the time because he talks about it's about energy. I mean, in the final analysis, the physicists tell us it's all energy. So you've got a whole bunch of people here and here are complementary uh, healers, and you say, well, well, do you do energy work? <sighs> Show me something that isn't energy work. Allopathic medicine is energy work. What do you think the pills are? It's all molecules vibrating at some frequency. You're just ingesting them or injecting them or doing something, but it's all energy work in that sense. You can't not do energy work. Everything's energy. So remember that mind can really be described more aptly uh, than, than calling it the brain as photons of light held in an electromagnetic field. We're talking about moving energy here. That's what healing's about. That's what change is about. That's what the mind is about. The brain is the gray matter inside your cranium. It's like a, a, the CPU chip in a computer. It's the physical thing that you can crack open your cranium and you've got this thing in there, but that's not the mind. That's just the brain. That's a different deal altogether. It may be the central processing unit, the place where the uh, energy patterns interpenetrate, but you know it's not even limited to the brain. Those of you who know about the energy field in general know that mind is not a function of just a connection to the brain part. There's some really important long-standing myths about change that I need to address before I demonstrate what I want to show you. And that is myth number one. If you've had a limiting belief for a long time, it'll take a long time to change it. Boy, that's a common one. I got so many people say, oh, it's so deeply embedded, Rob. You know, I've had this belief for 35 years, and it's just ingrained. And use all these anthropomorphic terms about how deeply it's embedded in your brain. You know, well, how deep could it be? You know, it's how many centimeters in there? You could get your finger in there and get one of the deepest ones. It's not like it's miles deep. What's that about? But we keep characterizing it in a way that makes belief change difficult. If you look at the reality of it, if it's photons of light held in an electromagnetic field, that's a different story. It isn't about deep. Ugh. All right. Anyway, most of the time, changing subconscious beliefs is more like changing a document in a computer. The computer is photons of light held in an electromagnetic field. It's an energy phenomenon. You can't go into your computer and dig in there. How deep can you get into the hard drive? I mean, it's a little chip. It's the same concept, and we've really made it hard. It doesn't take any longer to change a document that's been in there for 30 years as it does 30 and it's been in there for 30 minutes. And it's mostly true with belief systems people have carried around for years and years. I've just watched this happen in private practice over and over again, and in the classes I teach, people will say, oh, I've had this belief for 50 years. I mean, it's just remarkable, just remarkable. I had one, one quick story about that. A psychiatrist is using a psyche in Denver. He had taken the classes, and he had one of his patients was agoraphobic. You're familiar with agoraphobia? It's a fear of being out in the marketplace in open places and so on. She, this, she'd had this agoraphobia since she was about, uh, well, since she was a teenager because uh, she'd had it for over 50 years, and she was 60-plus years old. And it turns out it was an event that occurred in the eastern plains of Colorado. Her mother had taken her on a trip, and, and she was misbehaving. And so the mom said, you know, if you don't get your act together pretty soon, you're going to get out of the car, and I'm leaving you. You know, well, today we'd be all traumatized by that, but back in those days, that was what, <laughs> that's what your parents did. That's how they stayed in control. So the woman actually did stop the car because the kid kept misbehaving, put the child out, and she drove down the road. Well, not very far, but far enough to scare this little kid. And so she comes back, picks up the girl, the girl's in tears, piles her in the car, and they take off. Well, didn't take long before the little girl started to show these signs of fear of going out into open places. There are many places that are quite as open as the eastern plains of Colorado. I mean, it's a flat, desert-looking place. So she had this association with this place and with this fear, and nothing they had done. They tried drugs, they tried all kinds of therapies of various kinds, and this guy had just, this psychiatrist, had just taken this IK class, uh, a weekend class, the one I'm teaching this weekend, as a matter of fact, and, uh, and so he, uh, he, he got to a place with her, he just said, look, I've tried everything else, I, I gotta admit, I just went to this weekend workshop, I don't know if this will work or not, if it has anything to do with it, so he didn't really believe in it, and then she didn't believe in it, because she said, well, how can something like this affect a biochemical disorder, I mean, how can it work, and they both said, well, what the heck, you know, we'll just give it a shot, they did, and that one session, that, that agoraphobia disappeared, that woman was out driving a car within a week, going wherever she wanted. She had relatives she hadn't seen in the area unless they came to her house because she couldn't leave her house for 
all of those years. So it's just, I mean, that was a wonderful story and an amazing testimonial to the fact that I don't care how long you've had something, it boils down to photons of light held in an electromagnetic field, and if you can find the address of that belief and you can rewrite that software, you can change the outcome. So keep that in mind when you're saying, oh, I've had that for a long time, that'll be a tough one. Not necessarily. Myth number two, changing old behaviors and thought patterns is difficult and often painful. This is the no pain, no gain myth. You've got to suffer, suffer, suffer first, and then you can change. Not so. Thought patterns and behaviors are caused by perception, beliefs. They're represented by specific configurations of photons of light, the energy we're talking about. Change the field, you change the belief. Change the belief, and you change the behavior and thought pattern. So it's all about how do you isolate the belief you want to change, how do you get the subconscious mind to do the work for you instead of making it so hard trying to do it consciously. And we're going to be doing just that. Myth number three, you need to consciously know what caused the problem in order to change it. Well, if I don't know what caused it, how can I change it? That's the mantra of mainstream psychotherapy because they're having to change things by figuring out what it was, telling you what happened, giving you this powerful insight, and then making a huge assumption that insight is a sufficient condition to change. Now, that's what really turned me around after I got out of graduate school because I was sitting down doing that really well with people. We got real clear about why they were screwed up. <laughs> they knew, I knew, but they were still screwed up. Unsatisfactory, unacceptable. You had to figure out a way to change that. How do you get to the behavior? Not just through this ton of awareness. I don't know about you, I'm up to my eyeballs and in insights. Spiritual insights, psychological insights, all these insights. And then you've got to wonder, well, why does my life look like all these wonderful insights I've got? I mean, true. So the reason is we have been talking to the wrong part of the mind most of the time. So becoming consciously aware of the source of the problem is seldom necessary to change most beliefs or behaviors when you're dealing with the subconscious mind. That's where the power is. That's where the juice is. That's where the storage unit is for your beliefs. It's not about willpower. Okay. Let me give you an overview of the, of the process that I use. And this is um, basically the components of it. Think of it that way. Uh, to get the job done in terms of speeding up change. And literally, it can happen in just a few minutes. Establishing communication with the subconscious is step one. I was never taught that in graduate school. In fact, I don't think they mention the subconscious except talking about Freud. And Freud, I mean, if you listen to Freud, the subconscious is a place nobody wants to go. I mean, talk about a deep, dark abyss of, uh, you know, repressed sexual desire. And you know the term Freudian slip? You know what that is? That's when you say one thing, but you mean your mother? <laughs> yeah. That'd be a Freudian slip. Okay. So nobody wants to go there because they've made it a horrible place to go. But the fact is, it's no more horrible than your hard drive. You go to your hard drive all the time. If you open your computer and you get documents out of there and stuff, that's energy. So we're going to be communicating with the hard drive here. You're going to pre-test a desired belief statement. That's a very important thing to find out if your subconscious believes it or not. Like, uh, Juliana was very kind to come up here and... and, and uh, give her attention to this process and I had her say something that was pretty non-threatening, you know, my name is Juliana. But what if I had said something like, had her say something like, I love myself unconditionally, or I trust that I am a, a, a wonderful person, or anything that she would desire to be and to know about herself. Then all of a sudden the rubber meets the road. Now you're finding out from your subconscious mind, do you agree with that statement or do you not? You may have done tons of therapy, you may have been saying affirmations and meditated for 25 years, and I tell you, Surprise, surprise, you know, you'll say something you think is true and you do believe it consciously, but your subconscious mind never got the message. And that's the part that really needs to get it in order to have behavioral change last. That's why so much change tends to be temporary and, and made out of lots of willpower. All right, so we've got pretest the statement, get permission and commitment to change the belief using a psyche balance. The balance processes that I use, I call them balances because essentially what they do is, is they create a balanced identification or perception uh, of the left and right hemisphere of the brain at the same time for the new belief. And by doing that, using this whole brain integration process stuff, you can reduce the resistance to internalizing a new belief very quickly without all that effort and struggle. And the permission and commitment thing is really important. I, I've noticed in um, conferences I've attended uh, for energy psychology, as an example, uh, many of the processes make huge assumptions that if you have something that looks like it needs to be fixed, it actually represents something that's broken. I don't know about you, but a lot of times, whatever you call broken is a messenger. <laughs> you know, that message is there to, 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 that pain or difficulty or whatever you call dysfunction is there to teach you something, and you kill the messenger. 
So I found that it's much wiser to find out from the subconscious it's even a good idea to do what you're talking about consciously before you do it. it saves you a lot of grief later on and you don't have to get the proverbial two by four returning to get your attention because you managed to get a symptom to go away. This isn't about treating symptoms, it's about the cause of the symptoms. And then we'll do a balance, which is a, a, the process for change using whole brain integration of some kind or another, different, different varieties of that. We'll post-test the belief statement because it gives you a physical muscle response that's going to be different than in the beginning. So you have an objective way to measure a subjective change. You don't just say, well, how do you feel? You go, well, fine, you know, you look good. Uh, all right, see you next week. It's not that. You know before you leave the interaction whether that belief resides in your subconscious or not. So there's a way to know it for sure and then celebrate the change, and that's my favorite part, so we'll be doing that. Okay, so, let's see. I want you to take a look at some of these messages. What I did was I distilled some of the key messages that over the years of doing psychotherapy, I found that many people internalize from their childhood. You'll never amount to anything. You're worthless. You're not smart enough. No matter how hard you try, it's never good enough. Money's hard to come by and hard to keep. You don't deserve to succeed. No one will ever love you. And Bruce's favorite, you're going to get cancer because it's genetic. <laughs> this one uh, at the bottom, of course, you can make uh, generic, which is uh, you're going to get whatever disease you're predisposed to because it, you, it's going to get passed along in your family. Uh, so it doesn't, it's, I'm just... I'm just putting it out there to let you know that it doesn't matter what disease you put in this category of cancer, it's the same notion that I'm helpless and the situation is hopeless. I'm just going to get what I'm getting passed along. So these may be some of the messages that uh, you got. And the question is, what if you could change them? What if you could have anything on this list? What if anything on this list could be true for you? What I'm going to ask next is, I'm going to ask somebody else to come back up to the stage and I'm going to facilitate a process, first of all, to discover whether the belief that seems desirable to you is currently true in your subconscious. And if it isn't, then I'm going to facilitate a process to make it so. It'll take just a few minutes to do that. And so what I'd like you to do is just read down this list. And if one of these beliefs calls to you and just says, boy, I want that, it may not be true right now. I'm not sure, but I'd be willing to come up here to make sure would you like, you have one? Okay. Come on up. Yeah. Get this one. I might actually be able to finish my PhD. And which is that? I deserve happiness and success in my life. I deserve happiness and success. And your name is? Karen. Karen. Okay. Karen, I'm going to have you come over here, please. Mm -hmm. Like about so. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to have you put your arm out. We're going to do a little muscle testing together. Can I have you turn this way just a bit? Mm -hmm. Thank you. With your uh, chin parallel to the ground, your eyes focused down and open. Mm -hmm. I'm going to press down on your arm. I want you to be strong if you can. You ready? Okay. Be strong. Okay. So we're going to do what we did initially to establish communication because I can't yet, I haven't gotten a weak signal, so I don't know what that's like in Karen's system. So I want you to say out loud, my name is Karen. My name is Karen. Be strong, Karen. Good. Say, my name is uh, Frank. Be a guy named Frank. My name is Frank. Strong, Frank. Okay, can you feel a difference in that? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not pressing hard. I don't want to press hard. I'm not trying to make this dramatic. I'm just trying to press hard enough that she can tell when the muscle locks in place and when it unlocks. So we're getting a very clear signal here. Just for fun, I want you to do in your mind silently repeat the word yes. Hear that over and over in your head. And be strong as I press. Okay, repeat the word no over and over. And again, be strong as I press. Good, you feel the difference? Yeah, Pretty, yeah big difference. Okay, yeah. so what we're going to do is we're going to make this a little juicier now. We're going to have Karen actually say her desired statement out loud. <laughs> we're going to test it against what the subconscious mind currently has residing in there as a set of beliefs and see if she has any beliefs that support that. She may actually not believe it consciously. It's, part, it's possible she could already believe it subconsciously, and we don't know that until we test. So if you put your arm out again, I'm going to have you say your statement out loud, which is, I deserve happiness and success in my life. Look down and say that like you mean it. Okay, <laughs> I deserve happiness and success in my life. And be real strong. Oh, nice try. <laughs> Please, God, make it work. <laughs> that's, that's about wanting it with all your heart and soul, but not having the program to support it. And that's what I mean. You know, you say, oh, geez, I tried it, and I want that, and I'm really desirous, and oh, I'm all lined up, and your subconscious says, sorry, you know, no software for that one. All right, so what I'm going to do now is uh, I'm going to demonstrate a change process and this is different than teaching it, so please 
uh, forgive me in terms of not, wanting, uh, not being able to have the time to explain each little detail. That's why it's a two-day workshop. I can't make that into this hour or so that we have together. But I'm going to facilitate this with her by going through the protocol, generic protocol I, t I showed you, and we'll see what happens. So if you put your arm out for, um, for a minute, please. Okay. First of all, we're going to get permission and commitment. We've already tested the statement. We know that it, you're weak to the statement. The goal is to get her to be strong to the statement. Right now, she tests weak, although she's really wanting to be strong. <laughs> <laughs> and I can understand that. All right, so I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. You don't have to repeat any of this out loud. Just listen. And then I'm going to muscle test for yes and no responses and so on, OK? okay. All right, it's safe and appropriate for Karen to balance for this goal now. So be strong, Karen. Good. We get a nice, strong response indicating yes. All parts of the system are ready, willing, and able to balance for this goal using a new direction balance. So be strong if you can. Good. All right. Her subconscious mind just agreed to one of the several psyche patterns. You might be asking yourself, how could she know what that is? <laughs> well, I'm not asking her conscious mind. Turns out I'm asking her subconscious mind. And the real magic of this is lots of information is shared subconsciously that you're not aware of at all. Every time you walk into a room, especially if you're as close as I am to her right now, much, much information at the 4 billion bit processing levels being exchanged between us. So if I know what a new direction balance is, turns out I do, <laughs> I muscle test her and her subconscious mind can actually give me a response to that because it can access my hard drive. It's very interesting about this stuff because I did it in foreign languages just to prove this to myself. What a trip. I got muscle tested in Mandarin Chinese, and my, my subconscious mind knew what this person was, was saying. All the muscle responses were correct for the questions that she was asking. So it gets really interesting in a hurry. All right, so here we go. We've gotten as far as doing the actual change process. I'm going to require a chair for this, so if you'll hold on right here, I'm going to grab one. Uh, or I'm not. Oh, here it is. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I'm going to put you right there, and you can sit down in that chair. Okay. So what we're going to do next is we're going to utilize some of this left-right brain integration technology I spoke about. We're going to set up a system so that Karen's mind uh, can maximize her perception, left and right brain at the same time, while she internalizes this new belief. This is different than just saying affirmations, and I'll explain a little bit about that while she's going through the process. To determine the best way for her to, to uh, achieve this left-right brain integration, we're going to use her physical body because it's an electrical system. If she crosses her ankle one over the other, her electrical field actually changes. I didn't know if you know that, but when you cross your ankles or your legs, you're really changing your whole, the field in your entire body. Same with your wrists. Any place you can cross the midline of your body makes a different electrical circuit, just like a circuit board. So watch what happens. If you put your arm out like so, please, and cross one ankle over the other, it doesn't matter which one, looking down again with your eyes, I'm going to press down. You see if you can be strong. Okay, switch your ankles the opposite way. Let's see if it makes any difference when I test. And be strong now. Ooh, you see the difference? Go back this other way. Apparently, there is a clear preference here. Be strong. She's real strong when she crosses right ankle over left. And remember, this is all in relationship to this goal. This is not a general thing now. We're into a belief change piece. That's the target. And her subconscious mind is telling us, hey, this is the way I need to be configured optimally to get this belief to be true. So while your ankles are in the position that causes the strength, I want you to do the following with your wrist. Put one on top of the other straight out in front of you like so. I'm going to press down on both of them, and I want you to be strong if you can. Strong now. Okay, switch them the other way. Let's see if it makes any difference. Be strong now. You tell me which one feels stronger. Go back to the other way. Be strong now. Okay, and back the other way. Be strong. Yeah, this way does, doesn't it? Like yes. so. Yeah. We're getting a clearer signal. I just had to test a couple times because the difference is fairly subtle. So what you do with your hands now is just go ahead and interlace them like this. You can rest them in your lap. Okay. Here's what I want you to do. And then I'm going to have a little chat with the group while you're doing it. I'm going to have you close your eyes in a little while, and I'm going to have you be able to silently just repeat the statement. I'll give it to you, and then you're just going to repeat it gently over and over in your mind. And what I want you to do is I want you to actually invite any resistance to the idea, any other ideas like your statement is, I deserve happiness and success in my life. If you've got any other voices in there that say, no, you don't, you never did, you never will, all that stuff, rather than try to push them away or make them go away, I actually want you to invite them in. Say, okay, come on, come on, come on, come on, because it's an educational process. You're going to be saying this statement to this resistance until the resistance just disappears. So until you feel either a mental, emotional, or physical change, keep your eyes closed and keep saying the statement to yourself. When you feel that shift, I want you to open your eyes and we'll do the next part of the process. Okay deal? Mm -hmm. And I'll amuse everybody out here while you do this. Okay. <laughs> so I want you to close your eyes, silently begin to say the statement, I deserve happiness and success in my life. And while Karen is doing that, I wanted to make a couple of comments about what's going on. Uh, 
we've configured her body, not, in, not according to my guess or my judgment about what she needs, but her subconscious mind, which knows how that belief is blocked. It knows exactly what, what software needs to be rewritten to make it so, and it's in the process of doing so right now. It's different than meditation because most meditation is single focused and all other ideas must go away. You notice the instruction I gave her wasn't to do that. It was to say the statement and invite these other ideas in. It's not prayer because you're not acting, you're not really asking for intercession in some way, come please help me. It's not that kind of thing. You're just affirming this belief over and over. It's not visualization. It's not positive thinking. It's simply affirming a statement to be true educating the parts that are in resistance and doing it through the filters of whole brain integration. While in this posture, she can't think of the downside of this the way she used to. Left and right brain now are working simultaneously and they're perceiving this goal in a brand new way that she hasn't been able to every time she's thought about it in a normal sitting posture or just in her normal life. So it's really interrupting the cycle of over identifying with the left or the right hemisphere of the brain which kept her stuck. As soon as this comes into a whole brain integrated perception, the belief's hers, and we will and we'll test it out. Okay? So you keep, keep at it until you can feel something change, and then you just let me know, and I'll keep talking to all these people about this. So it's um, usually this process, I'd say on average, takes about two to five minutes for most beliefs to change. Small price to pay for something you've had all your life that's been arresting your life uh, and keeping it from being in that ecstasy, the picture that we saw. Uh, and really promoting a lot more of the protection and the scream energy to your life. So it can shift, it does shift, and it's not about me doing something, it's about her. In fact, all of Psyche is really about very little about the facilitator and a whole bunch about the innate wisdom and the divinity within each of us. It's activating that and moving it into a specific area of intention and giving the tools to the subconscious mind to do the job that uh, it's, it, it is capable of doing with the proper instruction for doing it. Sometimes uh, when the change is taking place, this is another interesting aspect of this process, is that it's not particularly visual. You don't have to visualize anything. If you're not a good visualizer, you don't have to make a picture in your head to make things come true. If you're, um, you tend to be more auditory, you, you make sounds in your head, you talk to yourself in your head, you can, you'll go there. However the belief is wired in that needs to be changed, that's what she's going to get internally. So sometimes you'll get pictures, sometimes you'll get sounds, sometimes it's just your body, your feeling. You'll feel the body change, you'll feel the muscles tense and then release. Happens differently for each person and different with each belief. Okay, she seems to think something's going on here, so we'll check this out. So unhook your uh, ankles and your wrists, unhook these guys, put your fingertips together like so. Just hold them there. This is equivalent to the save command. If you think about what she was just doing in a computer metaphor, she was editing the documents that kept her from believing she deserves this life that's going to work. Then we're saving this to the hard drive. We're making it a permanent document in her subconscious mind so that it won't just go away. It's the same thing as you always save your work before you turn your computer off, you know, so it's there when you get, get it next time. Same idea, so you can let go of that. Put your arm out to your side. I'm just going to test to see if where we are with the process right now. This is a sort of intermediate uh, deal. So just listen. Uh, this process is complete, so be strong if you can. Good. I get a nice, strong response. You can stand back up, please. I'm going to remove the chair here. We're at a place where her subconscious just reported to me, I've had enough of that. I got it. Thank you. So we're going to verify and see if that's really true. So I'm going to press a lot harder than I've been pressing just to make sure if this is true that, that there's no doubt it is. I want you to say out loud, I deserve happiness and success in my life. Looking down, say it like you mean it. I deserve happiness and success in my life. And be strong. Yeah, and if I let go, she brings like a springboard. <laughs> nice going. That's Thank it. you. Good for you. So hang in for just a minute. So I'm, I'm just wondering if, Karen, would you mind saying a little bit about what was going on while you were sitting down there? Well, I started saying all the things, you know, no, you don't, everybody's going to be jealous of you, you have to feel guilty, and then all of a sudden it was like, well, wait a minute, God wants everybody to be happy and successful in their life, and if God wants everybody to be happy and successful in their life, God wants you to be happy and successful in your Bingo. life. Bingo. And when I went through that process, it just, you know... Yeah. It was very logically based. Mm -hmm. if, this, if this, then that, you mm -hmm. know. So did you tend to hear, was that a conversation going mm -hmm. on in your head more than anything mm -hmm. else? But then as soon as I, as soon as I realized that, I felt like um, just kind of like a, a lifting, like a, a happiness mm -hmm. type of thing. Well, I think that I deserve happiness and success. <laughs> Might have something to do with the feeling getting to come in for a change. 
she went from the scream to the uh, ecstasy pretty quickly right there. Thank you very much. Okay. Enjoy the change. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for volunteering. Okay. So, what'd that take? Maybe five minutes while I was trying to keep you distracted so she had some, I mean, under, consider the circumstances. This is the worst possible place, you know, on a stage with people in an audience doing belief change work, and it works anyway. Imagine if you had the privacy of your own home and one other person to work with and you didn't have an audience the whole time. How simple things are. Uh, it's just been remarkable, uh, my experience in the change work. When this work came in, and I can say came in because I didn't sit down and, anal and, and, and analytically develop Psyche. It really was one of those born out of a moment of terrible frustration with graduate school training and other things I tried. All of a sudden, entire patterns of change were just downloaded in my computer. I went into my house, literally, and typed the information into a computer and said, OK, that's interesting. I wonder what that's about. And then I just read off the sheets and learned the work that way. It was very interesting. This was 14 years ago. So I was very skeptical, didn't believe in muscle testing because I'd never experienced it, didn't believe in these patterns until I could experience them myself. And when I saw the really miraculous changes that were taking place in short periods of time, physically, emotionally, spiritually for people, I finally just said, okay, you know, thank you, and I'll do it. So it's, you find your path and you stay with it because it works. And it's my joy to get to share this information with you. It's like Bruce and I bond because he's bumping the, the envelope of biology. I'm doing the same with psychology. We've been looking in the wrong place for the changes for a lot of years. And it's time to wake up and do it completely differently. So thank you for your kind attention. And uh, if you have an interest in learning more about the work, uh, Doug's going to tell you about our workshops on the weekend. Are there any questions before I uh, close? Anything that pressing and you need to know other than... You need to go, okay. One last thought. Okay. Is this something you can teach yourself to do? Can you do it with yourself? Is that what you're saying? Can you do this all by yourself? Yeah, you can. There are methods of self-testing that are possible, and they have their limitations. So it's, what's really good about it is if you have a friend or anybody, it doesn't even matter that they even know the work, and if they don't come to the workshop, that doesn't matter. What matters is one of you came. Then you'll know the work, and all you need to do is take two minutes and teach somebody muscle testing. If somebody else is pressing on your arm, it's just more objective than if you're doing the whole loop yourself. At least that's what I would recommend. A lot of people do it, and I honor that, but I would rather have somebody else testing me than me testing myself, especially when the issues are really where the rubber meets the road. Okay? All right, so final thought. Remember that your beliefs determine the limits of what you can achieve. As Henry Ford put it, if you believe you can, or if you believe you can't, you're right. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>